All right, so I'm going to talk about nonlinear optical pulse propagation in multimode fibers. This is work we've been doing recently in Frank's group, and we've uncovered a lot of interesting things, I think, and I'm going to talk about those in very, very big picture way. I'm going to try and explain to you why we're motivated to look at this stuff, not only in terms of the really interesting science, but the applications that can come out of this. Those applications are not immediate. There's definitely a lot of work that needs to be done before them, but I'm going to go into some detail talking about them because we're an applied research group and we do care about doing something that is going to eventually lead to an application that way. I'm not going to get into any detail here. I'm not going to be rigorous at all. And at the end, I'm going to include a list of the papers that I'm going to discuss. And I think if you're interested in that level of detail, you're interested in anything rigorous, you're interested in following up on this, I think you need to read those papers. That being said, I hope from this talk you're going to understand why we think this work is interesting. You're going to get a nuts and bolts idea of just a few specific examples of the things we're looking at. And you're going to understand maybe where this might come into play in applications in the future. The way we're going to go through this is we'll talk about the optical multimode fiber and the things you need to understand in order to understand pulse propagation. Then I'm going to look at some motivation for why we care about this work, and I'm going to preview the possible applications that we think it could lead to. I'm going to talk in the first part of research, I'm going to talk about multimode solitons. Solitons that propagate in multimode fiber, and then I'm going to talk about spatial temporal resonant radiation that they emit. And that's going to help you understand why we care about the solitons. Because through understanding the solitons, we can understand this kind of surprisingly complex behavior that we see with the spatial temporal resonant radiation. And the multimode solitons allow us to understand a lot of complex dynamics in the multimode fiber. Actually, the wave propagation is, is four-dimensional, uh, and it's very complicated to work out. So the multimode solitons are nice in that they provide a conceptual framework for understanding that. And, and even actually an analytic framework in some, some cases. In the second part of the research, I'm going to talk about complexity and emergence in very long disordered multimode fibers. And that's going to be taking place with 532 nanometer light in contrast to the 1550 nanometer light that we're looking up here. Then I'm going to look at a little more applications. I'm going to go into some more detail. I'm going to talk about some scientific opportunities in, in very little detail, but give you a, a flavor for why we think this is interesting, and then I'm going to conclude. So you need to understand what dispersion and diffraction are. You need to have a first-order picture of optical nonlinearity, and with that you can have another first-order picture of what a soliton is. You need to understand what optical fibers are and what the modes in them look like. So dispersion and diffraction. A pulse of light contains multiple colors, multiple frequencies, and in any material, those frequencies travel at different speeds. As a result, a pulse is going to broaden as it propagates to the material. You'll have red at the beginning or blue at the end. Uh, because of these different speeds, red might be at the beginning and blue may be at the end, or vice versa, depending on the sign of the dispersion. Um, but you're, either way, you're going to get broadened pulse. If you have a finite beam, it's going to spread due to something that's very similar to that, diffraction. So dispersion and diffraction are kind of two sides of the same coin. I'm probably going to say that a lot. It's important to emphasize that light is a spatial temporal wave, and there's this kind of relationship between these two things. But just before I move on, a finite beam diffracts. It spreads out due to diffraction. If we look in the limit of small angles and relatively narrow band pulses, we get equations that look like this. These are wave equations for the electric field envelope propagating along one spatial dimension. And we're looking at the envelope in one time dimension or one spatial dimension. These are wave equations, and they have pretty much the same form. In fact, they have exactly the same form up to these factors. The thing interesting about dispersion is it can take on other sign. It's negative for anomalous dispersion, which is going to be at 1550 nanometers, and it's positive for normal dispersion. So there is a little bit of a difference here, 
but for the most part, they're really directly analogous. The consequence of this linear wave propagation in space is the action of a lens. A lens is an inhomogeneous refractive index in space. It has some index that's higher than the surrounding medium, and it has a thickness that's largest at the center and thinnest at the edges. That creates an optical phase front that causes the pulse or the, the beam to focus. After it focuses, it's going to spread out. And these are all just consequences of that wave equation that I showed you previously. And this inhomogeneous refractive index. So now third order optical nonlinearity. The lowest order optical nonlinearity in fused silica or glass is third order, and that's why we're concerned with it. There is, of course, a chi 2 in, in many materials, but most or all materials have a chi 3. That's the lowest order in the materials we care about, so that's the one we're going to look at. The nice thing about third order optical nonlinearity is it gives you something like this. It locally changes the refractive index as a function of the light intensity at that point. So if you have a beam of light that has the highest intensity at the center, and you let that propagate in a material with third order optical nonlinearity, it's actually going to act on itself. The light can modify its own path. It can act like a lens for itself because it has this optical thickness. The refractive index is center is largest at the center and lowest towards the edges. That's like a lens, so it causes self-focusing as it propagates through the material. So we combine all these things together and we get soliton. Action causes a beam to spread out. Self-focusing causes it to focus. So when those two things are at equilibrium. You have an unchanging wave packet that propagates invariantly. It doesn't spread out. It doesn't focus. It's just a stable soliton. This is stable in one dimension, in either one spatial or one temporal dimension. But in higher dimensions, things aren't so simple. A simple picture of that is this one of equilibrium. So, you know, we have the force of gravity acting down on this beautiful duck, and we have the force of the trampoline acting up on it. And at equilibrium, the time evolution of the system is very boring. It's trivial. It just is the same for all time. That's equilibrium. That equilibrium is also in the soliton. There's an equilibrium between the compressive force of self-focusing nonlinearity. I use force not, not obviously in a literal way, and the dispersive force, the spreading force of dispersion or diffraction. If that dispersive force gets larger, just like the gravitational force when this eats a cheeseburger, you know ducks eat cheeseburgers, then the trampoline needs to push up harder. Likewise, if you have a larger dispersive dispersion, so let's say the dispersion of the material increases, or let's say that you have a shorter pulse, it has more color, so it'll disperse faster, in both cases, you need a larger self-focusing nonlinearity in order to maintain that soliton to reach equilibrium. So this kind of thing plays out in a lot of different nonlinear wave systems. There's a really good demonstration of this here, and I'm going to play the video, and then I'm going to discuss it a little bit in the context of optical fiber. Obviously, solitons in all environments are very exciting. What we saw here is a collision, so something like this. These two solitons come towards one another, and at the point of collision, there's just a phase shift, and then they emerge from the collision otherwise unchanged. So this is an elastic collision. So this kind of particle-like behavior is 
is the essence of why solitons are interesting, in my opinion. And this is going to lead to using them as tools to understand more complex behavior. So as I said, light is a spatial temporal wave. It exists in three spatial plus one, or three spatial x, y, and z plus one time dimension. Normally we look at propagation along the z-axis, which is usually the long axis uh, of these, of the transverse space and the time domain. That equation, again, in the approximations I discussed before, looks something like this. You can see that it has a kind of spherical symmetry if this has the right sign. If we add the nonlinearity, we get a term that looks like this. It's nonlinear in the electric field envelope. So this would be a, something like the intensity. If this is the electric field envelope, mod squared is going to be proportional to the intensity. That is the 3 plus 1d nonlinear Schrodinger equation. So does that have sol soliton solutions? I said it was more complicated in 3D. It is more complicated. In 1990, your own Silberberg wrote a very inspiring paper where he wondered about that. He noticed uh, in the nonlinear Schrodinger equation in 3 plus 1 dimensions, it's unstable. So it doesn't seem like it's going to work. But maybe there's some higher order effect that can stabilize it. Then we could add this light bullet, a 3D soliton. Many groups were interested in that. Many groups tried to realize that. And quite a few came close at different ways. Just as an example, Frank's group achieved a spatial plus temporal soliton, so one space and one time. Um, but it's in general been a very difficult problem to realize this experimentally. And that difficulty is in part what motivates us to look at multimode fiber. Multimode fiber, and even single mode fiber here. So a multimode fiber, or a fiber in general, any kind of waveguide, constitutes an inhomogeneous refractive index profile, which we can include in this 3D equation using a term like this. Notice that all these have an I. They're all acting in the phase of the field. So as I said, there's an inhomogeneous refractive index. A single mode fiber has an elevated refractive index, or any kind of fiber has an elevated refractive index at the center, and then a lower refractive index going out towards the edge. So it's a little bit like a very long length. In the case of a single mode fiber, that region of elevated refractive index is so small that light can only propagate straight down the fiber. But a multimode fiber, it can actually take on multiple paths. It has this spatial degree of freedom because the core is larger. It can really only take on discrete paths. These discrete paths correspond approximately to modes. Before I talk about modes, though, let's examine why I called this talk interdimensional. That's a very grandiose terminology, I will admit. But there's something kind of grandiose about this system, I think. Specifically, it spans from 1 to 3D as you vary the size of the waveguide. So if you have very strong confinement in space, you have a single mode fiber, and that's effectively 1 plus 1 dimensional. If you increase the size of the fiber, you make it arbitrarily large, you're eventually going to reach something that is effectively 3 plus 1 dimensional. We know that the soliton over here is stable. 1 plus 1D nonlinear Schrodinger equation is maybe the most well-studied soliton system out there. But the 3 plus 1D we know is horribly unstable, unfortunately. So these guys looked at this analytically, using a vari variational approximation anyway, and they found that there are actually stable spatial temporal solitons somewhere between 1 and 3D. So in this intermediate dimension between 1 and 3D, we have stable spatial temporal solitons. So that is the original motivation for looking at this. We have this possibility for totally new kind of nonlinear wave behaviors in an interdimensional medium. It is the multimode fiber. So the multimode fiber we're looking at mainly is graded index fiber. It has a parabolic refractive index profile rather than like a common step, step index profile that would look something like this, just one refractive index here, no continuous variation. The refractive index in the core is larger than the cladding. It's a guiding fiber. 
you can think about this a little bit like the limit of a whole bunch of lenses, bringing them arbitrarily close together and making them stretched out, you know, for a very long length. The idea behind that, which is discussed very elegantly, maybe not so transparently uh, in Jackson's textbook, is that it normalizes the path length, or comes close to normalizing the path length for all these different rays that propagate through the fiber. So rays traveling far off axis end up having very close to the same optical path length, the path length being the integral of the refractive index times the distance. All these rays have more or less the same optical path length. That's going to correspond to a low modal dispersion. That's very important for us because it means that those modes can interact with one another very efficiently. More precisely, those modes are eigen solutions to the radial wave equation in the fiber. And they are electric field patterns that propagate through, or electric and magnetic field patterns, electromagnetic uh, field patterns that propagate through the fiber unchanged. If we're just looking at the electric field, which is good enough for what our application is, and we take a few approximations, we can describe those modes in the LP basis, LP01 is going to be the star of the show for much of what I'm going to talk about and what follows, but there's all kinds of them. These are the Gaussian modes in the graded index fiber. These ones have some lack of radial symmetry, so there's fourfold degeneracy for these harder modes. Uh, and then we also have twofold degeneracy for the radially symmetric modes, the LP0Ns. We're mainly going to look at the LP0Ns to begin with. So as promised, why are we interested in this? I think this is really important to say that throughout history of science, advances in making and measuring and manipulating light have preceded different advances in different parts of science. And often these have been really tremendously impactful advances. Recently, we have good things like LIGO and Bell test experiments to look at where all kinds of optical technology, in particular very precise interferometry and single photon sources and detectors, came into play in order to do cutting edge science. Historically, things like the quantum revolution, the discovery of bacteria and planets, those resulted from new optical technologies in those times. So it's very motivating to live in the world of light and to think that maybe something that you do can lead to a very tremendous outcome, like one of these examples. Phone in your laptop, etc. Telecommunications, of course, relies on all kinds of optical technology, mainly optical fiber, but also the lasers that are used to go through those fibers. We're seeing emerging applications in manufacturing and surgery using lasers for different kinds of processing but also using lasers in biomedical diagnostics. These are maybe the, uh, the applications that are motivating us the most right now, but I'm also going to talk about the telecommunications side. So just to summarize, we want to develop new capabilities to do cutting-edge science, but we're also interested in, in reaching mainstream applications, and that's part of why we care about fiber. So just to enumerate a few possible applications, we have telecommunications, we have multimode fiber lasers, and we're particularly interested in multimode fiber lasers in our group. I will say that's maybe the most realistic uh, near-future application of these. And when I say near-future, I mean 10 years. Um, you could think about doing things like bioimaging, spectroscopy, these different kinds of manufacturing, and then these more interesting, maybe scientific applications. Um, you can think speculatively about computing with multimode fiber, and you can think about generating very finely controlled ultra-fast light. And, of course, fashionable clothing with multimode fiber, that's probably going to be skyrocketing industry, I have to say. So let's look at telecommunications.
Optical fiber has been great for sending information because it has a high carrier frequency. You can use very short pulses, super large bandwidth. This is not even a fair picture. Actually, this is more like 250 microns wide. And most of this is just the copper, so that's not too fair. But you can just see from looking at this, obviously we can send a whole hell of a lot more information in the optical fiber than in the copper wire. So that's great. That's pretty much enabled the internet. And it's enabled the internet for a long time. People have been using it more and more and more. You know, we're seeing more and more things. You know, Netflix is requiring more and more bandwidth. And advances in optical technology have made it so that the price of the internet hasn't really gone up. It's improved without really having to increase the cost to the consumer. But in the fiber optics world, we're kind of worried uh, because we're reaching the nonlinear limit. We're reaching the fundamental limit of the information that can pass through those fibers. And we don't know how to fix that. Or it's not obvious how to fix that, I should say. And by about 2020, 2018, we're going to reach a point where it's going to start to cost more to transmit information. So this is called the capacity crunch. It's going to be an economic situation, to say the least. Um, I don't want to be too, I don't want to be fear-mongering, but it, it could be significant. So it's worth being worried about. And I'll, I think a lot of people in, in my community are worried about it in terms of this future problem. So, it's coming. <laughs> so, it's a serious problem, uh, just like winter is a serious problem. And maybe multiple fiber can solve it. You can have these N different modes, they can constitute N different channels, so that could be a way forward. I think a lot of scientists like this. I don't know how much people like it in the telecom world, um, because it would be a big change. But I think it's very promising, and I think there's a good chance, in my opinion, that it could eventually be out there in the field. All right, part one of the research, we're going to talk about multimode solitons. What happens when you propagate linearly, though, in multimode fiber? We talked about this already. There's chromatic dispersion, the pulse broadens, different colors travel at different speeds, but also there's modal dispersion. The different modes travel at different speeds because they have correspond to different optical path lengths, right? So, we got all these modes. Let's look at these radially symmetric modes for simplicity. And let's look at the simulation. So here are the modes right here, pulses in those different modes. As we propagate through the fiber, they spread out from one another due to modal dispersion. So they're traveling at different speeds. And they're each broadening due to chromatic dispersion. So that's kind of the whole story there, uh, linearly. If we add in nonlinearity, the pulses can kind of interact with one another because they're locally modifying the refractive index in the fiber. So the modes are still traveling at different speeds, but if you look down here, something quite interesting is happening. We're forming a multimode soliton. And what a multimode soliton is, it's a non-dispersive wave packet. So this pulse here is not changing its duration. And it's moving at a common group velocity despite the fact that it contains multiple modes. So nonlinearity is counteracting the forces of dispersion, chromatic dispersion, and modal dispersion. So a multimode soliton contains multiple spatial modes, and it's a non-dispersive wave packet. It's not, strictly speaking, not mathematically, a soliton. It is a solitary wave. But for the purposes that we care about, it's kind of like the extension of a 1D soliton in single-mode fiber to the case of a multi-mode fiber. And specifically, it's going to help us understand more complex things because it behaves kind of like this particle. So it gives us a conceptual and actually gives us an analytic framework in some ways for understanding much more complex dynamics. And you can understand this analogously with chemistry. You need to understand the elements, interactions between those elements, and then you can understand much more chem complex chemical reactions that you couldn't, you couldn't even hope to understand those chemical reactions if you didn't have kind of the basic building blocks. Solitons of 1D have been basic building blocks for understanding a lot of one-dimensional nonlinear optics, things like supercontinuum and mobile lasers, more recently micro-resonator combs, and maybe rogue waves. So 
there's a good precedent for what I'm saying here, why multimode solitons could be useful. And I'm going to actually prove to you, at least from one specific example, of why they're useful. So I was showing you the 3D equations. Because we have modes, we can actually conveniently model the system using the modal pictures. So we have the generalized multimodal null and Schrodinger equation. The details are not important. They're described in these really nice papers. Um, but basically, we can look at propagation of each of the modes linearly in these terms. And we can look at the coupling between all those different modes due to the current nonlinearity, as well as harder effects like Ramon and uh, self-steepening. So with those included, what happens? What happens when you launch a pulse in the multimode plasma? If the energy is really low, you're going to see linear propagation. If the energy is a little bit higher, you're going to see a multimode soliton form. If the energy is higher still, you have too much energy. You don't you have too much energy for one multimode soliton. So it's going to look something like this. Field's going to compress and it's going to blow up and you're going to see these multiple pulses. So what's happened here is the pulse has compressed and it's decomposed into its multimode soliton constituents. So it's undergone a spatial temporal soliton fission. It has blown up in space-time, so you'll notice that these are different multimode solitons, one here, one here, one here, one here, and they're temporal solitons, but they have different spatial characteristics. They're made up of different modes. So we have this whole family of multimode solitons, and a pulse blows up into its constituent multimode solitons through a spatial temporal fission. This is the first clue, the first indication that propagation, nonlinear propagation of multimode fiber is spatial temporal. So the energy obviously is important. And in one dimension, the energy for a soliton is important, very important analytically. And it looks something like this. We have the fi fixed spatial area here and the temporal duration down here. So the temporal duration is obviously a free parameter in 1D, but the spatial dimension is fixed by the size of that single mode in the fiber. In multimode fiber, though, that's not fixed. It has the spatial degrees of freedom. So is this still true? With that kind of question in mind, uh, Zing Muzu in our group has been looking at few mode fiber. So fiber that only has these three linearly polarized modes in it, three spatial modes. He is doing experiments that look something like this. He'll launch light in at 15, 15 nanometers. And through soliton fission, he can spectrally isolate. So he can just filter out one multimode soliton. So this is what the whole beam looks like. It's a superposition of all those three modes. And this is what the multimode soliton gets, looks like when it gets filtered out. It contains some combination of those three modes that I showed previously. Interestingly enough, as he increases the energy, the pulse of that soliton that gets formed is more or less constant. It's about 100 femtoseconds long. But as the energy goes up, the area, the spatial area, increases. So it is kind of like we postulated. It's not exactly the same. There are some more details that, that need to be acknowledged. But basically, these are spatial temporal solitons. They are not 3D spatial temporal solitons, like we talked about the light bullets that your own Silberberg uh, talked about it in his paper, they are spatial temporal solitons, and that they're solitons that have spatial temporal aspects because this spatial aspect, the area, is a degree of freedom. It changes. So they are spatial temporal solitary waves, in a sense. With that, let's go back to many modes and let's understand something kind of complicated. Spatial temporal resonant radiation. So we're going back to these guys. We borrowed a laser from Chris Yu's group in our department, and that laser had about 500 nanojoules. So if you look at the simulations I was showing you before, those was like at most 20 nanojoules. We're sending in 500 femtosecond pulses, and now we're sending in maybe 10 times that, maybe 50 times that pulse energy. So the idea is that we wanted to do supercontinuum. We wanted to get past the point of having 
just a sauton or a couple sautons and really just blast the fiber. We wanted to see what's kind of the limit of nonlinearity in this fiber. And what I see when I do that experiment is this. Uh, this beautiful light comes out of the fiber, visible light. Remember, we're starting in very invisible light at 15-15 nanometers, and we see these discrete spectral peaks in the visible, going down even into the, into the ultraviolet. The measurement of this looks something like this. So this, this is a super continuum that we see, just a typical example. There's all kinds of things going on in here. Raman soliton generation, Cherenkov radiation, multimode Cherenkov radiation, and these distinct spectral peaks. We're going to zero in on these guys, just understanding these for now. So we can do simulations using the generalized multimode nonlinear Schrodinger equation, as I described before. And the simulations actually replicate this pretty well, even just with a small number of modes, which is actually very surprising. The, the fiber has like 100, 300 modes, uh, and we can model a lot of it qualitatively just using five modes. But we see these distinct spectral peaks in the supercontinuum. And something that is very interesting that I'm going to talk about when I get to the applications is the fact that we actually expect light to be generated out here, going all the way out into the opa opaque region in the fiber. Even though we're including the loss, the fact the fiber really only transmits up to about here. That's interesting, I'll talk about it later though. As a clue to how to understand this, let me remind you that the gridded index fiber is kind of like a continuous lens. So as light propagates through the fiber in multiple modes, it has a periodic focusing. It looks something like this. So, as I was saying when I was talking about Zimu's work, there's this spatial degree of freedom. There's this spatial aspect to the soliton. So we know the energy looks something like this, and we know the effective area is oscillating. It's oscillating sinusoidally. So, we can use this to understand what is going to happen to the soliton in general. The soliton is a particle, and it's our, it behaves like a particle. And one aspect of that is that it's sort of greedy. It's conservative. It doesn't want to give up its energy. So let's say that the soliton tries to make this the case. It tries to not lose energy. This turns out to be true. This turns out to be very useful, and we can do something called soliton perturbation theory to under, understand a lot of higher order effects. This has been tremendously important in understanding one-dimensional nonlinear fiber optics. We're going to do something similar here. Based on that, we expect that the time, the temporal duration, is going to oscillate. It's going to oscillate in sync with the effective area. So that's going to look something like this. This is the time. These are the spatial, the transverse spatial dimensions as the pulse propagates through the fiber. It's going to shrink in space-time, grow in space-time periodically. Spatial temporal oscillations. Periodic spatial temporal oscillations. As a result of this thing being a soliton. Based on that, we can do theory. And the theory predicts experiment very well. So there's good agreement between those two which is kind of remarkable, actually, considering how simple the theory is. It also models what we see in simulation very well, including uh, a more advanced simulation that includes some of the carrier wave effects. Okay, so what is going on? Um, I haven't really explained to you how these dispersive waves come about. I've explained to you that there's this spatial temporal oscillation but not really why all of a sudden we see this, these distinct spectral peaks. I would recommend you read the paper if you want the real details, but for now I'm just going to talk about it in a more universal way with this analogy with this, again, beautiful, obese duck. He, he's our soliton, he's in our nonlinear medium, and remember, at equilibrium between dispersion and self-focusing nonlinearity, the system is static. If we have some other small wave here, he can in general interact with this guy through the nonlinear medium. If we raise these guys up and let them freely oscillate, bouncing on this trampoline, 
they're going to have different resonant frequencies, something that's like proportional to the square root of their mass. And they have different masses, so they have different resonant frequencies. Suppose that this omega is some multiple, some harmonic of this guy. That's going to mean that periodically these guys are going to land at the trampoline at the same time, and energy can be transferred through the trampoline deformation to this guy. So there's a collision through the trampoline. There's a collision through that medium. So this is going to allow resonant energy transfer at multiples of this periodic oscillation. Here's an experiment. We have the two high energy soliton waves, large mass, and we have a lower energy dispersive wave over here. Resonant energy. <laughs> due to that timing, uh, in the case of free oscillations, due to the fact that we're looking at some multiple of that periodic oscillation. So it looks something like this, right? Resonant energy transfer from the this guy to the little guy. So big picture thing, the periodic exchange of energy between degrees of freedom in something that's uh, oscillating about equilibrium creates an instability at that period or multiples of that period of oscillation. And through this, you can actually transfer energy to things that would normally not oscillate very efficiently. So for example, on a trampoline, you could bounce a, an ant really efficiently by this mechanism. Part two of the talk, self-organized instability and graded index multimode fiber. Starring LP01 and also starring all the other modes in the fiber, starting with LP02. Alternative title is going to be the rise and fall of LP01. So what do I mean? In contrast to what we're doing before, where we're looking at pretty short fibers, supercontinuum and dispersive wave stuff is a one, uh, one meter or less fiber, we're now going to be looking at much shorter wavelengths and much longer fiber. The reason that that matters is that all of a sudden we have to care about the fact the fiber is not perfect. There's a lot more things, a lot more imperfections that are going to be scattering the light. And those imperfections, we can understand those as coupling, kind of randomly coupling the modes and the fiber together. So there's this kind of stochastic element to the propagation. There's a diffusive like behavior here. In addition to that, we have to consider the loss. The fact that there's mode dependent loss, and there's mode dependent nonlinear interactions, there's mode dependent disorder, and it's varying longitudinally across the fiber. So this is a, a complex network. All the modes are interacting with one another. So all these different mechanisms, and if we look at sort of the, just the topology of that interaction, we have a complex network. So there's a whole field devoted to studying complex networks, and the key insight in that field is that you can understand a lot, actually a very amazing amount can be understood about very complex systems just by looking at the interactions and the connections between those distinct elements in that system and completely ignoring the details of those elements. So if we ignore the details of the modes and we just look at the topology of their interactions, we can get some idea. I'm just going to describe to you what happens in the experiment and give you some intuition for what happens, but this is the kind of idea that motivates why this is interesting. So as I said, I'm going to launch a 532 nanometer pulse into the fiber, and I'm going to excite some combination of all the modes. So at low power, this is what the beam profile looks like coming out of the fiber, low pulse energy. Over here, we're plotting the size of the beam that comes out of the fiber as a function of the pulse energy, and this is what the spectrum looks like. So these are going to foreshadow what we're going to see. So here are the characters, here are the modes. The star of the show, as I said, is going to be LP01. You'll see what I mean. And we have all these other modes in the fiber, 44 more I'm not even showing here. So initially we have some combination of those modes and we increase the pulse energy. The modal composition is changing. It's changing in a surprising way, I would say, um, because it's going from a disordered state to actually a very nice coherent field. And we went from having the energy distributed throughout all the modes, and now we have the energy distributed 
not through all the modes. It's just an alpha zero one. So the energy is kind of condensed from all the modes into LP01. You can think about it that LP01 and all the modes have competed for the energy, and LP01 is the champion <laughs> of the modes. But, as this tends to be, and as I foreshadowed, LP01 is not the champion of the modes for long. The other modes get revenge on LP01 through a spatial temporal modulation instability. So, spatial temporal modulation and stability amplifies the modes across the spectrum. So, we see the higher modes come back with a plump, and as we increase the pulse energy, those higher modes are coming back. So, LP01 has risen and fallen through this evolution. Numerically, I verified that LP01 is actually the most unstable state of the system which is surprising because it's a nonlinear attractor. So, that's kind of actually a universal behavior of many systems, you might think, uh, through self-organized criticality. So, what I'm saying here is that the field and the multimode fiber competes, all the different modes compete with one another, and the mode that always wins is actually the one that's three-dimensionally most unstable. So we have self-organized instability, the rise and fall of this most unstable state. We can do analytics to figure out what is going on with this instability and its spatial temporal modulation instability, as I said, and there's good agreement between what we see in experiment and theory. So summarizing, we have nonlinearity and disorder and dissipation as well. All of these things cause coupling between the modes and the cooperation of all these things causes the nonlinear tractor. It causes LP01 to win, but it also causes LP01 to lose in the end. They drive the instability as well as the attractor. So we have a universal attractor to a critical state. This is something we've actually seen many times. Uh, I've seen it in when I was looking in the anomalous dispersion regime with femtosecond pulses with about a kilowatt peak power, 25 meter long fibers, something like this. That was preceding spatial temporal fission. So we saw this, attra this attractor preceding the spatial temporal breakup of the field. I saw it later in shorter fibers with much higher power. And more recently, a series of very nice experiments have seen it with nanosecond and and long picosecond pulses in the normal dispersion regime with pulse, center, pulse power or peak power or something like this. John Wei Liu in our group has seen it more recently in very short fibers with high peak power in normal dispersion. And what I'm discussing here is very long fibers, strong disorder and dissipation, and again we're seeing the same thing. So the physics in all these different situations is somewhat different. But the common characteristic is the coupling network, the interaction between all those modes. So there's a universal aspect of propagation here that in all these like very like orders and orders of magnitude different in all these different cases, we're still seeing the same behavior. So that's quite interesting, I think. So this obviously could pose a problem for telecommunications, for spatial division multiplexing. How realistic is that? I don't want to say it's super realistic. I think that eventually it will definitely be a consideration that many mode interaction through nonlinearity could be a problem. This kind of emergent behavior, emergence of spatial temporal complexity, that is something that we'll need to be worried about. It would constitute a big problem. I don't think initially it's going to be an issue, but definitely as spatial division multiplexing becomes more mature, it will be something that we'll have to be worried about. In addition to that, we have a way of maybe studying complex networks experimentally. We have kind of a laboratory test bed for complexity science. And because a lot of complexity science is studying things like social networks and studying financial networks, or it's studying systems that are not really experimentally accessible, uh, maybe not experimentally accessible in a repeatable, controllable way, the fact that we have one here that is very complex and very controllable is interesting and potentially it might have some application scientific.
Maybe we might also do some computing in that. I don't know how useful that will be, but it's kind of cool to think about, and I'll talk about that just a little bit later on. So going back to applications, we talked about tele telecommunications. Now we can look at fiber lasers, and we can look at computing just briefly. And I'll leave these other two for you to think about. So as I said, multimode fiber lasers are maybe the most plausible application of multimode fiber. And the first simple thing to understand is that they can have a higher pulse energy, a higher stable pulse energy, a higher power than single mode fiber lasers. And the first reason why is they just have a larger mode area. You can fit more light in. So we know the energy of a stable pulse in a mode locked laser is proportional to the effective area. And there's a much larger effective area in multimode fiber as compared to single mode fiber. In addition to that, there's a larger force of dispersion. So if you look at something like a soliton, you need a greater energy, a greater nonlinearity, a greater power in order to counteract that dispersion. So the stable pulse energy is going to be higher because of the fact that you also have modal dispersion in addition to chromatic dispersion in the multimode fiber. The most interesting thing is we have new ways of controlling the pulse evolution. This is something that my group is thinking about right now. We don't have any concrete things to talk about just yet, but it's an exciting new opportunity. If we just look at the first two considerations, though, you can get an idea for why this is interesting from an ignoring the nonlinear dynamics and just why it would be interesting for applications. If we can make a multimode fiber laser with this, we could realize three to five orders of magnitude improvement over modern fiber lasers. Almost a million times, I'm saying. So that would be really, really good. Uh, that would correspond to almost a terawatt peak power. It would be a diffraction limited intensity of something like approaching 10 to the 20 watts per centimeter squared, which is a number you have no, no reference frame for, I'm sure. That's 10 to the 15 times more intense than the surface of the sun. So that would be, in fact, um, at that level of power, we really have to worry about a lot of things that I'm glossing over here. So I'm not promising that we're going to have a million times higher power lasers. That would be great. We could have a laser based on, let's say, $5 worth of multimode fiber, and it could be reaching these kinds of intensities. That would be a hugely great thing for a lot of applications. That would be transformative for things like manufacturing and for biomedical imaging if we could do that. But how we get there is really very much a research problem. So the point is multimode fibers have this huge potential for fiber lasers, but it's definitely a research problem to go from where we are now, just understanding the basic physics, to going to there, a functioning, high-power, multimode fiber laser product. In addition to high pulse energy, we can generate new kinds of light in the multimode fiber. As I said before, these spatial temporal resonant radiation, this spatial temporal dispersive waves generated by those oscillations, are interesting because they span a very large range of frequencies. In fact, we're seeing colors generated over a much broader bandwidth than any other process that I'm aware of, save for maybe something like high harmonic generation. So we have a very cheap way of generating a very broadband light source, and actually each one of these distinct spectral peaks corresponds to a very nice coherent ultrasonic pulse. So there are things like free electron lasers, which have niche scientific applications, are very expensive, and are very valuable for doing a lot of different science. I think if we had a very cheap source, something in the tens of thousands of dollars range, that could generate ultra-short pulses spanning from, let's say, the ultraviolet, maybe we can get into the soft x-rays if we're thinking a little bit sci-fi, even going into the mid-IR and going to maybe into the microwave, microwave territory, we have a source of electromagnetic waves over a super wide bandwidth. We have a way of, say, interrogating matter over all the different resonant frequencies and things we care about. It's not obvious what the killer app for this thing would be, but it's a new potential. And as I was saying at the, in the introduction, every time there's a new capability with light, there tends to be a new advance in science. So that's why I'm excited about something like this, without having a concrete way of how we could use it. In addition, we can think about things like neural networks. 
Neural networks are obviously configurable, reconfigurable networks. Multimode fiber is a reconfigurable network. In particular, we can exactly write out what that network looks like in terms of the adjacency matrix. In the case of nonlinearity, let's say we had a strong beam to control that network. It would look something like this. And the point is the details aren't too interesting. I don't know whether it's going to be useful for applications, but it may well be because we have this huge bandwidth. We have this huge information processing capacity, and we have this way of making an ultra-fast reconfigurable network. Maybe in the future this would be a way of making a neural network computer um, that could have a very, very high information capacity. In addition to that, because we have a reconfigurable network, of course we have a sandbox for understanding complexity science. I think maybe that's more realistic, but I'm not going to say that we're never going to see a neural network multimode fiber computer or something similar to that. In addition to complexity science, though, we have this interdimensional medium to think about. And we have a way of controlling the, the dimensionality of the system to understand the nonlinear dynamics and to understand the physics. That's a very interesting aspect of this. And I'm just going to give you an example in terms of understanding phase transitions and phase stability. So in one dimensional nonlinear optics, there's this thing called mod modulation stability. This is uh, another very important concept in nonlinear dynamics along with the solitons. So what that does, if you launch in a continuous wave field, I'm approximating that by a very long pulse here. This is the time domain, this is a zoom in on the time domain, and this is the spectrum. As that propagates through a fiber, the interaction of nonlinearity and dispersion causes it to break up into a train of ultra short pulses. So there's been this kind of phase transition. It's gone from a continuous wave field, a smooth field, into this kind of glassy crystal. Look at that in the interdimensional medium. So this is a simulation of that propagating through the fiber in all the different modes with different colors. Obviously, this is complicated. I just want to point out that it looks similar. We're seeing this kind of glassy crystal, this periodic pulse train, and it's existing not only in one mode, but in multiple modes. And it's maybe a little bit like a sort of molecular glass, molecular crystal. And it's natural to wonder what happens as you increase the size of the fiber. What happens if there's a thousand modes involved? Is, it, is a thousand modes still going to act like a one-dimensional system, or is it going to act like a three-dimensional system? As we saw with the soliton, there's a, there's a bifurcation as you vary the dimensionality. That's why this is interesting. Phase transitions are kind of universal. They can be tracked by their universality exponents. And one of the things that varies, that varies the universality exponents, is the dimension. So I think it's interesting that we have the capacity to vary the dimension and ask what happens to the universality exponents of this phase transition as we vary the dimensionality. Does it change abruptly or does it change continuously? I think it's going to change abruptly, but I'm, I'm genuinely not sure. We're thinking about this in step index fiber, uh, working on this with some great theorists from France, and we're seeing that in normal dispersion with high nonlinearity, we're generating these incoherent spatial temporal wave objects. And as we vary the number of modes in the fiber, effectively varying the dimensionality of the system, I'm actually surprised by how, how, how much the dynamics are the same. I'm expecting more of a change, and at least for the range of modes that I've considered, the dynamics are very similar as you change the number of modes which is surprising considering how much the spatial-temporal complexity is changing. So multimode fibers give us a lot of different things we can look at. They go from free space to single mode, but because we can also look at the effect of different disorder and the effect of different loss, we can go from a dispersive system to a dispersive and diffusive system. We can also vary the amount of loss, so we can go from like a passive conservative system, like a single mode fiber, to a multi-mode fiber laser, which is a dissipative system. So in one multi-mode fiber system, we have a way of studying all these different kinds of nonlinear wave propagation. I like that because it means that I only have to worry about multi-mode fiber, 
and we can understand lots of different aspects of nonlinear wave propagation just in this very nice, experimentally convenient, controllable multimode fiber. So far, we've looked at just this part of parameter space. This is maybe even an exaggeration because we really are only looking up to about 100 modes. We've really barely scratched the surface of disorder and dissipation. So we've done a lot, but we also haven't done very much. There's a lot of things to look at. It's a very fertile area scientifically. In summary, these things might be important for high power fiber lasers, ridiculously high power fiber lasers potentially, and they may also be useful for telecommunications. We looked at multimode solitons, and we saw how multimode solitons can help understand more complex spatial temporal nonlinear dynamics. In particular, we looked at resonant radiation from spatial temporal oscillations of those solitons. We saw that multimode solitons are non-dispersive wave packets that contain multiple spatial modes. So there's this equilibrium between nonlinearity and modal and chromatic dispersion. Then we looked at propagation in long disordered multimode fibers, looking with uh, the normal dispersion regime of, or we looked at the normal dispersion regime, so 532 nanometer light. That light is shorter than 50, 50 nanometers, so we had to worry about disorder. And considering disorder and considering loss in the fiber, we see this self-organized behavior, we see this self-organized instability, the rise and fall of LP01. I said there's some scientific opportunities here in addition to the applications. We have an interdimensional medium and we have a reconfigurable complex network. So there are lots of interesting scientific applications and there are interesting scientific questions that come out of this. Before I go, I do want to just say that this is a team effort. There's myself, Logan Wright. Um, my colleagues, fellow PhD students, John Wei Lu and Zima Zhu. And then, of course, my PhD advisor, Frank Wise. They've all contributed quite a bit to this talk. At UCF Creel, we have Amin and Dimitri who are contributing as well. And also at Corning Research, we have Dan and Ming who are helping us out. Our funding comes from NSERC and ONR. And I have to, I have to finally acknowledge LP01, who, of course, is in many ways, very often has been the star of the show here. Here's the list of papers that I talked about in this presentation. This is by no means an exhaustive list of work in this field, and I, I hope throughout this talk I've given a few references that point to some really excellent papers, but of course there's many excellent papers in this area, and we compiled a more complete list in Frank's webinar slides, which will be available on our website.